minutes. And we do have an order. And so we'll start with Professor uh, Senya Lubich. Good evening, I hope you can all hear me. Um, good evening, members of the board and Dr. Perry. I'm Senya Lubisic, History Humanities faculty and the online education coordinator. I felt that it was important to speak to you tonight to mark one year of pandemic teaching, which at my house we refer to as war zone teaching. Uh, there is an objective to reach and you fight to stay alive and to keep as many of your students and colleagues alive as possible. Uh, in my own household, there were seven people vying for internet access. And from March to July, my husband who is full-time faculty at PCC and was deputized to help his colleagues with the transition, uh, he and I worked seven days a week, 14 to 16 hours a day, trying to help colleagues transition to pandemic teaching. As we made that transition, colleagues came to me with questions like, what is Zoom? How do you use a mouse to write characters on a Zoom whiteboard? My lecture notes are handwritten. How do I convert them? How do I share music with students? I recorded a lecture, but I don't know how to share it. If I wanna talk privately with a student, how do I do that without the entire Zoom class hearing or seeing my comments? And do I really need to recreate every quiz and exam question by question in Canvas? We have a very small staff for online education and faculty had to troubleshoot and find ways to teach largely on their own. I received emails at all hours of the day and night as faculty struggled to reimagine and recreate their content. I have walked through innumerable Canvas course shells, videos, assignments, and contact page, content pages. I have watched faculty weep in frustration and then weep in relief when we found a solution to a problem that seemed insurmountable. But what I want the board to know is that these questions and challenges turned into action. In a matter of weeks, I was hearing from Mike Hillman that he learned how to hang and connect cameras in his garage using ladders so that students could still see how to use a pottery wheel. Uh, in Zoom meetings with nursing faculty, I saw that they had taken down family pictures and put up whiteboards so they could recreate a classroom environment, albeit in their dining room. I have talked with physics faculty who purchased tablets and styluses to be able to accurately draw and plot graphs for students. Cosmetology faculty had to find ways to demonstrate techniques and skills to their students and then have students demonstrate them back. At the start of this semester, I got an email from Patty Glover saying that she had taught students to use Canvas Studio to record their practice, share it with her, and receive feedback on their skills. What I would like the board to hear is that we have talented, skilled, and dedicated faculty who are experts and specialists in their fields, and that one year ago, the shift to pandemic teaching stripped entire departments and divisions of the tools that faculty had mastered to teach their students. The pandemic placed us in garages, living rooms, patios, and corners, and innovation and adaptation was the only option faculty had. I have been consistently humbled by the solutions faculty have found to remain connected to their students and to keep teaching. Despite the content knowledge that faculty have, Online teaching requires a new set of skills, uh, skills of technology and regulations like accessibility. Our faculty have worked tremendously hard to build those skills in the shortest window of time. Skills I have built over 20 years of online teaching, my colleagues have learned and applied in just one year. If ever anyone wanted to argue that college is where innovation happens, my colleagues have demonstrated that a thousand times over in Zoom sessions, screencasts, videos, voice thread lessons, diagrams, content pages, the list goes on and on. I am so very, very proud of the work they have done in the least conducive of circumstances. To that end, over the winter session, our online program built a Canvas course site for the visiting accrediting team. We had to choose 30 courses for the team to review, divided between pre and post pandemic. When we finished building the site, Dr. Hester and I looked at the courses and I told her that I was more proud of the post pandemic courses. I believe that's a powerful statement of what our faculty have achieved in the past year. And I wanted to share that tremendous accomplishment with you. I would love to keep sharing what our faculty have done and I welcome you to reach out to me with any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lubitsch. Appreciate your comments. Our next speaker is uh, Teresa Villanueva. Good 
Teresa, if you could unmute. Yes. There you are. <laughs> okay. Do I have to turn your Can you enable my video? Camera on. Here we go. Okay. I'm Teresa Villeneuve, and I teach media and film classes here at Citrus. I'd like to talk a little bit. Here, I'll start my video. There we go. I'd like to talk a little bit about teaching during the pandemic since morale among faculty is pretty low. And I think I know why. Over the years, I've been impressed by my colleagues and the level of professionalism with which we have cooperated towards the college's goals, particularly financially. There have been times when we've been told by administration that they can't afford extra, to add extra sections and asked if we could add a few students to our classes, for example. Um, just a few years ago, we were approached to change our benefits plan because it was so expensive, and we voted to do that. Since I teach media and film, my classes are built around specific films that students watch as homework so we can discuss techniques and principles of visual storytelling. In the middle of the pandemic, with only weeks before the start of the fall semester, I was told the college could no longer afford to license films that I used for some of my classes. I didn't know what to do. How do you teach motion picture appreciation with no motion pictures? It's like teaching English with no books. I knew the library had a service called Canopy that had full length films, although they were mostly older films that I wasn't familiar with. Beggars can't be choosers, I thought. Um, I mean, I knew it was a tough time for everyone. So um, I thought that's better than nothing. Um, Although I was confused about how these classes I taught, which are a profit center for my department are something that you can't afford materials for, um, I was frustrated that the limited support that I was, had been given was taken away. I spent a lot of hours watching Canopy films trying to figure out if any would work and then remaking lectures and changing lessons. I was really struggling to fill in the gaps when the library budget was cut and I was told I couldn't assign those films either. In the end, a lab fee was added to one class, so students would bear the cost of the films. And in my other class, I had to refer students to the county library's subscription to Canopy. Then I found out the reserve actually went up during the pandemic. Effectively, the college was making money while cutting essential support for instruction and placing the burden on students. So yeah, that affected my morale. Now, back in the day, I could look around at my colleagues and, you know, maybe we didn't make as much money as the instructors at a neighboring college, but I could always point to my benefits package as being a little bit better, or maybe we had smaller classes, or we had resources that the neighboring colleges didn't. But as time has gone on, as a faculty, we've cooperated so much that those things have been eroding away. It's depressing. I've heard you've been told that the faculty are loving being at home and that it's so easy for us. Last semester, I had a student whose whole family had COVID and her father died. How am I supposed to inspire that student? How am I supposed to explain that she has to pay extra to take my class? I've been let down by the district as have my colleagues. It's happened little by little. But the lack of support for faculty has reached critical proportions during the pandemic. I hope that as we move out of this period, we can learn from and correct some of the unfortunate decisions that have been made. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I have lost my video feed, but I can hear you. So I will continue. The next speaker is Anna McGarry. Hi. Welcome. Can, can you hear me? I can. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna McGarry, and I would like to start by reading a recent email that I received from a student. Students at Citrus College are lucky to have a Spanish teacher like you. You transitioned your class so effortlessly, and your online classes are impressive and comprehensive. I will be telling future Citrus students to look out for your classes, and I am glad I was able to take this class before transferring. Despite what my students said, it has not been effortless. I don't get emails like this because I've been drinking margaritas with little straw umbrellas this past year. <laughs> I get them because for the first six months of the pandemic, I worked 12 to 15 hour days, seven days a week, 
to undertake the monumental task of converting 30 years of teaching to an online format. The quality of my product speaks for itself, and I welcome board members to attend any of the online courses I've created this year. Word has gotten out to the students, but apparently not to the administration. They seem to think I've been on vacation simply because I no longer have a commute. I want to set the record straight. My workday begins at 6 a.m. It does not end at five and I don't take weekends off. At a previous board meeting, I appreciated that Dr. Contreras asked, what support are you getting from Citrus during the pandemic? And I would like to answer him. In language arts, our librarians and our secretary, Kathy Day, have been extremely helpful. Our Dean, Gina Hogan, has worked tirelessly to keep our division running smoothly. However, the district as a whole has done next to nothing for us. Before campus closed, we got a 30 minute intro to Zoom. That's it. While my neighbor who teaches at Mount Sac received six hours of Canvas training workshops, Citrus just gave us links to do it yourself videos and expected us to learn to use this complicated software with zero training. Our two online coordinators, Senya and Chong, who prior to the pandemic provided support for the 20% of classes that were offered online, were now expected to support the entire campus with no help and no extra reassigned time. Why did the district not hire consultants to help them with this astronomical workload? Instead, during this unprecedented crisis, when the college needed three Senyas and six Chongs, we were told not to contact them at all because they were too busy. In addition, it was made known that we shouldn't bother asking for reimbursements for equipment we needed to purchase to do our new online jobs. Why were the Citrus vans not converted into geek mobiles, transporting much needed equipment and technological support to the faculty who were struggling with this transition? Why wasn't there a 24 seven help desk created to respond to our ongoing technology problems? We're teachers, but because the district wouldn't hire more technical specialists, we've had to figure out how to do that job too, while scrambling to do our own newly recreated full-time jobs. Hence the reason for my 80 hour work weeks. There's a reason we have one of the largest reserves in the state. Our financial resources have not been used to meet the needs of the students, faculty, and staff. This pattern of underfunding necessities while putting on a frivolous show has only served to enhance a false image of the college that is increasingly devoid of substance when behind the scenes we're falling apart. I see surrounding colleges providing meaningful support to their students and employees. I hope you realize that you are being shown a Potemkin village. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Professor McGarry. Our next speaker is Professor Telesco. Welcome. Oh, <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Lisa Telesco and I'm a proud member of the faculty of the English department for the past 26 years. And all my years of teaching, I have grown and developed into a better teacher because I've listened to the suggestions of my students. By embracing a receptive and humble mindset while communicating, I have learned more from my students than in the many books I have studied. Each Zoom class ends with many students saying thank you. And I thank them also. Sadly, Communication at Citrus between the board administration and the faculty has not been as open and productive and therefore has not been beneficial to easing the stresses of the COVID-19 era teaching. What are the stresses we are enduring as teachers? You have heard some so far today, but there are many, many more. Do you know what they are? Have you asked us? The stresses are financial, physical, emotional, and spiritual, but those of you who have asked us know this, and you would also know if you asked us 
and have a plethora of examples of these stresses in your memory if you listen to us with empathy. I have many examples of the stresses of my students. Some of the answers I've had to questions I've asked them about how they are doing. I'm scared because my aunt is dying from COVID. I'm frustrated because I applied for a Chromebook but never heard back. I'm worried that my friends who are protesting will get hurt. If you don't know the stresses the faculty are enduring, how can you truly know us? How can we better serve the students and improve student outcomes? The decisions made by the administration are mostly communicated verbally through the grapevine, not in written documents. This leads to confusion and many wasted hours deciphering the through the grapevine information. If you would like clarification on this, please ask us. We're limited in our time to speak today. What would I do differently as an administrator to help make the college the top college it could be? I would hold weekly office hours for drop in chats like we as faculty do for our students. I would have done a faculty survey at the end of spring 2020 for suggestions to improve online learning and have implemented the changes at the start of fall 2020. One, I would have in writing three plans for reopening the college that account for all the possible variables and that is formed from asking faculty directly what their ideas are for reopening. I would have a suggestion box, would read them weekly and would respond in writing to each. And like my Dean Gina Hogan does, I would thank each faculty member in person for all they have done and ask how I can help to reduce their stresses. Truly knowing us will lead you to one conclusion. We have earned the respect reflected in our contract requests as brought forth to you from our negotiating team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Ryba. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Dave Ryba, um, longtime chemistry instructor and current CCFA president. So um, Dr. Perry, members of the board and everyone else in attendance, thank you for your time. Life's events are learning experiences. 10 or 15 years ago, uh, Citrus College switched to the 16 week compressed calendar. This was done simultaneously to get students through college a little bit faster uh, and also to increase the college's FTES. It was an administration driven change uh, that forced many faculty to alter the way they taught. Um, generally it meant longer class periods, different days of the week, et cetera, just changes all around. Um, in hindsight, some of these changes were good, others maybe less so, but faculty adapted. More recently, we tweaked another sacred cow, the PPO medical coverage that was uh, referenced earlier. Um, most faculty have said they haven't really noticed much of a change. We were told that it would save the school money and that the coverage would be as good or better than what we'd had before. Again, most people haven't really noticed much of a difference, but some have, and generally it's not been in a good way. Uh, just this week, I learned that a prescription that my doctor issued for me is not covered. So now I'm the middleman figuring out what my options are to uh, uh, change that around a little bit. The most recent change is unique in that it wasn't decided on, but rather imposed on us by the pandemic. I think that as with the compressed calendar, we will see permanent changes. And while not everyone will like the changes, faculty will do what they do and adapt. What we have to avoid though, is to let what we are giving up become permanent. It's already been a year that my bedroom is my office and my basement is a makeshift chemistry lab and video studio. At times I don't notice the clutter. But then in moments of frustration, I very much do. I had to buy a new computer last spring, then replace it two weeks later when the first one died. I was told there was no budget for things like this at Citrus, so I've incurred both the inconvenience and cost. Though in fairness, Citrus did spring for a $50 whiteboard for me last spring. Uh, other changes have also steadily crept in. Emails at all hours, requests for extensions or other allowances from students. And of course, given that our students often have it worse than we do, it's hard not to accommodate them. On a positive side, it's been fun to learn new systems uh, and to hear what other faculty are doing. We have a very, very creative body of faculty who are a pleasure to collaborate and commiserate with, but it all takes time away from the non-teaching parts of our lives. 
uh, from our families, our hobbies, and our sanity. The CCFA recently conducted a survey of its members related to vaccination in particular, and I wanted to share a few parts of it. Firstly, almost 75% of the 110 faculty who responded have had their first chat. It's been a long time coming, but there is hope. About 60% of faculty are happy with some aspects of teaching online. And while the majority look forward to returning to campus, the sentiment was dominated by cautious and safety, or caution and safety. Individual comments were the most interesting. There were 60 or so, so it's hard to generalize, but recurring themes were safety and investments in safety. Uh, the need to teach many specific classes face-to-face -face, and the continued use of Canvas and Zoom even after things have gotten back to normal. In closing, I would ask you, the board, to not be cheap. Faculty and other groups have real needs. Our online coordinator is overworked. Faculty are hiring outside people to come fix their home computers so they can do their jobs. They're buying computers, software, and cameras with their own money. While no one can see the future, Citrus has, Citrus has an embarrassingly deep reserve or deep pockets with a reserve of about 40%. We're a year into this pandemic, pandemic and despite the hope of the light at the end of the tunnel, frustration has grown and morale has sunk. Citrus needs to get moving. Thank you, and I wish you all continued good health. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Brown. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the board, ladies and gentlemen of the cabinet and Dr. Perry. As a longtime faculty member at Citrus College, it's actually not unheard of for me to address the board, although it's usually about something exciting that's going on in our automotive program. And although there are both exciting developments and urgent matters on the Barranca side of campus where pandemic or not, both faculty and students are on campus daily, I will be addressing you today as the bargaining chair for the Citrus College Faculty Association. I'm not going to attempt to bargain with you, that's not appropriate. I do, however, wanna tell you a little bit about where we are, how we got here, and what I see as positive developments from our meeting with your team last week. We did a lot of good work in this most recent round of bargaining. Most notably, we resolved some years old working conditions issues for our faculty and student support services. The beauty of it is we found that resolution uh, in this case creates new flexibility that will also benefit the district in significant ways. As my friend Robert Samus has said of bargaining with our unit, quote, we approach things from the perspective of problem solving unquote. I'd like to think I have played a role in the district's team being able to view issues in that light. Rapport, credibility, respect, whatever it is, we have largely worked very well together. Similarly, I've built credibility among our full-time faculty. As the old saying goes, this isn't my first rodeo. This is not the first time I've served in this capacity and folks have come to know that I shoot straight with them. If they have an issue, I will do what I can to seek resolution. If it can't be solved, I'll tell them. In this way, a large measure of my role in bargaining is managing expectations. So that brings us to where we are and how we got here. None of us expected to find ourselves in a hot spot of a global pandemic. As we navigated the minefield that was 2020 and entering the fourth quarter of 2020, things looked downright bleak. California budget surplus had turned into massive projected deficits. The district credibly reported there was a projected 16.7 million in potential funding deferrals. And as such, expectations were adjusted downward. But at the 11th hour, it was reported that the district had approximately $13 million more money in the bank than we had previously understood. I'm not gonna get into how this happened, but it happened. As you might be able to imagine, the idea of managing expectations went out the window. There are 170 members in the bargaining unit that is the full-time faculty. They are not greedy. Like you, they're navigating a global health crisis and trying their darndest to do their jobs. A job that has recently had a very steep learning curve where every step now takes longer and that in a variety of ways has cost everyone more just to do their jobs. 
Now entering the second quarter of 2021, things are completely different again. California is now reporting an expected record surplus. Those funding deferrals appear to be off the table completely as well. But here's the good news. The faculty ask is exceedingly small. <clears throat> I told you our members are not greedy. Despite the district's good fortunes and the improving fiscal health of the state of California, I believe the district can still credibly say there are many unknowns. As such, we're not asking for anything different than what we had talked with the district's team about in November. We'd like to be able to reopen on the issue of salary in the fall of 2021, and again, if necessary, in the fall of 2022, when more of the unknowns are replaced with hard data. On the bright side, the district's team, your team, did not balk when we mentioned this last week. They did, however, state that they were not authorized to agree to anything, and that was disappointing. Neither I nor the CCFA leadership more broadly relishes the idea of going to impasse with the district when we all have enough on our plates navigating the circumstances in which we find ourselves. I would argue that the stakes are exceedingly low. I ask that you help me put this behind us so we can focus our attention on what Citrus College does best, serving students. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Our last speaker is Professor Miles. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Terry Miles and I have been a full-time faculty member in the chemistry department for 22 years. The purpose of my address this evening is to share with you a veteran faculty member's perspective regarding trust between the faculty and, and upper management. I do want to emphasize that these are my views and do not necessarily reflect the sentiment of the entire faculty. The facts, however, speak for themselves. About three years ago, while serving on the CCFA bargaining team, our side was presented with a spreadsheet from the district's team outlining the cost implications of rewarding district employees with a permanent one with permanent 1% 1 raises in each of the following three years. According to the district's team, such a reward projected that six years after its first year of implementation, the district would suffer such an enormous deficit that not only would it spend down its entire unrestricted balance, but it would end, end up being in the red to the tune of $16 million. As this figure surprised our team greatly, we spent some time validating the figures and found them to be an error. Upon bringing this to their attention, the district's team quickly corrected the error, and the result was now one where the ending balance was projected to be 9 million in the black after the first six year interval, resulting in a $24 million difference. To put things in perspective, that difference was about one third of the unrestricted annual expenditures that year. Fast forward to last October, the conventional belief at the time was that the district was facing potentially dire financial times given the state deficit and low enrollment. Before October, the last public documentation of the district's estimated end of year balance for fiscal year 2019-2020 was rendered in the CCFS 311 quarterly report in May. The figure projected then for the unrestricted ending balance was just short of 22 million. In October, at two adopted budget presentations delivered to the Citrus community, the CFO did not report the ending balance. Although there is no requirement for her to do so, it had been the practice at these presentations to do so dating back as far as can be found. Members of our CCFA leadership were soon to find out that the district would be estimating an increase in their ending balance of over $12 million from the previous year, moving the 2019-2020 unaudited ending balance to 33.5 million. Needless to say, this realization surprised our bargaining team and shocked a significant number of faculty members. As you know, the faculty soundly rejected the district's last best and final offer last December. Many of us feel the district might have been able to avoid this had they been more forthcoming with their financial status. I encourage you to ask yourselves how your constituents would feel having known that Citrus was sitting on a $33 million reserve while simultaneously being asked to support a bond measure last fall. I would also encourage you to ask your management team why important financial data like the ending balance was left out of the adopted budget report to the public. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes our, uh, our reports, rather our comments from the community and now we'll move on to reports.
And we'll begin with Dr. Perry. Thank you, Dr. Rasmussen, and good afternoon, all. I'd like to begin by thanking the Flex Day Planning Committee, as well as the Classified Development Committee and the Faculty Learning Institute 